My number two best chess game of the 1990s is Nigel Short versus Jan Timmen from Tilburg 1991. This game is an absolute classic and will be familiar to many of you, so I've decided to give it the Every Chess Move Explained treatment in which I break down the game one move at a time so that everyone, but especially beginning and intermediate players, can enjoy this great struggle. Nigel Short is probably best known today as being one of FIDE's vice presidents, and while you may or may not be a fan of whatever the last thing he tweeted was, it is hard to deny that he's done more than just about anyone to popularize the game throughout the world. He's won a chess tournament in every continent except Antarctica. As a player, his career has been tremendous, but it's easy to forget that in the stretch from 1990 to 1993 when he played Kasparov for the unofficial PCA World Championship, he was on absolute fire and was regularly winning amazing games like this one. Short selects an open game here with pawn to e4, and his opponent, Timmen, responds provocatively with knight to f6, Al Yekin's defense. I am an Al Yekin's defense player myself, but even I think it is a little bit provocative at the highest level. Now, the point is to goad this undefended pawn on e4 into extending itself, and it does so with pawn to e5. This is the best move. The knight heads to d5, which is the best available central square, because e4 is a square that the knight might be trapped on. So now we get d4 expanding with that second central pawn and pawn to d6. This is a critical move because black must challenge that pawn on e5 or it will definitely be the source of a major advantage for white. So after pawn to d6, if white wants to be uh, particularly aggressive, then sensible is pawn to c4 and even pawn to f4 as a follow-up here, which is the four pawns attack. However, what grandmasters typically like to play is knight to f3 in this position. This move is a little bit more conservative, but it consolidates white's gains in the middle of the board and further expands. Now, what black players play today and what I like to play is the capture on e5, which immediately eliminates the strong pawn on e5. But in the 1980s, what was trendy was the more dynamic pawn to g6, which is played in the game. I do not like this move, and I've not liked it even since I was a young player. I have always been very, very resistant to structures here where I have a pawn on e5 challenging my bishop on g7. That pawn on e5 controls very important squares in the middle of the board, and it restricts my bishop. So personally, no thank you. But part of the reason that I think that is that I've seen games like this and they helped inform my understanding of the problems of these kinds of positions. So here we get bishop c4 developing and attacking the knight. The knight falls back to b6 and attacks the bishop. The bishop falls back to b3 and attacks nothing. Uh, and now black does need to be a little bit careful because, for example, a move like knight d7 would run into knight g5. You've got to watch out for the f7 square whenever a bishop is pointing at it. Now pawn to e6 is the only way to defend that square, but white just needs to find bishop takes e6 to gain a winning advantage. Pawn takes, knight takes, hits the queen, the queen moves over, and knight takes c7. Crunchy time, the rook and the king are hit, and that will win the game in fairly short order. So that's not what's going to happen, of course. We've got grandmasters playing this game, and they're unlikely to fall for tricks against f7. So we get bishop g7, now knight g5 would just be met by castling. And now queen to e2, great move. The queen is supporting e5 and getting off of the d-file where there could have been a queen trade after black captured on e5. So after queen e2, black develops with knight c6 and white castles. Question for you, what about the move bishop to g4 in this position? Well, if you like this move strategically, two thumbs up. Very, very good. This is a great strategic move. Black would love to exchange the minor piece, and particularly Black would love to exchange the knight on f3. The problem is a tactical one, and this is definitely an idea you should hold on to if you've not seen it before. Bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7, and the king has been lured into a check from the knight, and now the bishop will get captured on the next move. There's nothing for black to do here but suffer because the king is going to be exposed to a very dangerous queen and knight attacking combo. 
So again, we've got grandmasters. So I'm pointing out these tricks on F7, but they're not going to fall for it. And so of course, black does play the more circumspect castles in this position. After castles, we get pawn to h3. This stops bishop g4, which would have been a problem now that black has castled. Pawn to a5, trying to trap the bishop on b3. Pawn to a4 saying, nope, no trapping my bishop. And now pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, and black has used this pawn exchange to be able to leap forward with knight to d4. This is exchanging a minor piece, and it seems like a great idea. White really has no choice but to capture, and now black captures with the queen, and this is a great moment to pause and try and assess this position. Now, instinctively, I might look at this position, maybe you also look at this position and go, hmm, I love this position for black. Look at how beautiful this queen is in the middle of the board. Also, this pawn on e5 looks like it's in trouble. It is immediately in danger of being captured. This is unfortunately a bit superficial. I think that if I glanced at this position, I would be very happy to take on the black position, but after seeing how white plays, I would not want to take on the black position. The problem is that, as you know, queens that are developed early in the game can often be harassed. And that's the case here. The queen is going to be hit by the minor pieces that are developing. And that's going to mean that black is not going to be able to develop these pieces quickly enough. And in particular, black is going to struggle to challenge white's control over the D file. And that's going to be a huge, huge issue. So even though it looks nice to have this queen on d4, objectively, a significant advantage lies with the white pieces. Rook to e1, defending that pawn on e5, and now pawn to e6. <clears throat> Just like I mentioned earlier, I don't like the Albert variation having a fianchettoed uh, bishop on g7 facing a pawn on e5. Well, I like it even less once the pawn is on e6. Now these squares... All of the dark squares really are super, super vulnerable. At least the pawn on e7 was helping stem some of white's control over these dark squares. I would much rather have played bishop d7 and left the pawn on e7, and I'm not sure why Timon felt the move e6 was necessary. The computer doesn't even condemn this move, but I really think that it's a strategic mistake. And the way the game develops, you are not going to want to have played pawn to e6. So... For whatever reason, it is played. Knight d2, great move because the knight is headed to f3. This is better than knight c3 because the knight didn't have anywhere to go from there. Now knight d5, so that after knight f3, when the queen falls back to c5, white is not able to play bishop e3 because the knight on d5 is controlling that square. At this point, we get queen to e4, and this is a great move. Another two thumbs up move. This move intends to swing the queen over here in conjunction with bishop h6 and knight g5, white will have maybe a little bit of a basic attack, even a beginnerish attack, but that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. The inclusion of the queen in an attack on the white king side or on the black king side is going to be very, very strong. So after queen to e4, black is desperately trying to defend. So a queen trade is a good idea, queen to b4, but white's having none of it. Bishop c4 cutting off the attack on the queen, and now knight b6 attacking that bishop. Again, it looks like there might be problems, right? Black is going to exchange the bishops or exchange the queens and liquidate the pressure, but great move b3. Another two thumbs up move. This allows black to wreck the pawn structure, which black does. Knight takes c4 and pawn takes c4. And if this were a, were a position in which the queens were vanished from the board, black would be much, much better because of how terrible these pawns are. But the queens are on the board, so the pawn structure is really irrelevant. What matters is if white is getting there with the kingside attack. And as it turns out, those pawns, and in particular the D file here, act to split the board in two. As a result, black is really struggling to include these pieces in the game. That is going to be a theme from here on out. And therefore, white is simply much, much better here, maybe even winning already. Now, in this position, black would love to try to challenge the D file here, rook to D8. But then bishop g5 attacking the rook and rook d7, that blocks the bishop on c8. So 
Black ends up really struggling to further develop from here. So what Black plays instead is Rook to e8. White needs no further invitation. It is time to take the d file. I will take the only open file on the board if I can. Rook d1. Now queen c5 pulling back with the queen. And queen h4. The attacking uh, mechanisms are starting to take place. Bishop h6, knight g5. It's all coming in. Once you see an attack like this, you constantly try to replicate it in your own games whenever your opponent fianchettos. So after queen to h4, we get the move pawn to b6. The bishop on c8 is finally coming out. This is only possible because the queen did leave the e4 square where it was lined up with the rook on a8. Now bishop to e3 attacking the queen, and this is a very, very nice move. The thing is, it seems like you might just go ahead and play bishop h6, but then after a trade the queen can fall back to f8, defending the dark squares, and actually black isn't really much worse here at all. However, by including the move bishop e3, the queen is pushed back to c6, and after it falls back to c6, then you go bishop h6, and now black's queen is much further away from defending the dark squares on the king side. After bishop h6, there's a big threat of knight g5 and then trading on g7, so black retreats bishop h8, to keep that one defender of the dark squares on the board. Now we get rook d8 invading on the d file. The only reason to control an open file is to eventually invade. So white does so now. Bishop to b7 creating a battery here, but it's just biting on the knight on f3. As long as that knight is on f3, there's no mate on g2, although you're certainly watching out for that mate. Now rook to d1 bringing the one Rook that is not contributing, the one white piece that is not contributing to the open file and doubling on that file. And now bishop g7. This is a nice defensive move from Timon. His point here is that he's going to try to trade on uh, h6. And after the queen recaptures, there won't be enough defenders on the rook and he can capture the rook on d8. Therefore, the rook on d8 steps back to d7, but obviously it's tremendously dangerous here. And there are ideas like taking on g7 and then taking on f7, and those would lead to mate. Because of ideas like that, black decides and is correct that it's necessary to defend the f7 square, so rook to f8. It's often said that attacking moves are pretty, very beautiful moves, but defensive moves are really ugly. That's true. Rook f8 is the best defensive move available to black, but it is such an ugly and unpleasant move to play to bury the rook here just to defend a sad pawn. So after rook to f8, we get bishop takes g7. Finally, the defender of the dark squares is liquidated. Bishop takes, king takes, and now rook to d4. Their ideas of invading with the queen, for example, on f6, and then swinging the rook over to finish the attack. At this point, we get rook to e8. Black is shuffling a little bit in this position, struggling to find anything productive to do. And now queen to f6 check. The king is pushed back in this position. And at this point, h4, preparing for h5. So black stops it with pawn to h5. And this is where it's time to pause and figure out how to finish the game. Everything is in perfect, perfect position for white. The rooks are amazing. They're dominating the open file. That knight on f3 is stopping mate on g2. You'd like to include it with knight g5, but it is difficult. The queen is obviously in a perfect position, and the pawns aren't really able to contribute at this point in the game. White is so, so, so well placed, but white needs one more piece to finish off the game. How can you include that additional piece in the attack? The answer is king h2. Boom. This is one of the most quietly devastating moves of all time. It is such a striking and brilliant idea that I think anyone who's seen this game cannot help but have it burned into their memory and you're constantly trying to recreate this idea in your own games once you've seen it. The point of king to h2 is simply to use the king to be the final piece needed to finish off the black position. The king is headed to h6, where together with the queen, it can give mate on g7. Or The queen will give mate, but the king will be the supporting piece. Now, 
Timon does not anticipate what White is up to in this position. He just thinks the king is shuffling a little bit. You can understand that because the idea is so spectacular and unique, it's very hard to anticipate. The only sensible defense at this point was for Black to pull the bishop back to c8 and try to challenge that rook on d7. Any delay simply means death. Now, it turns out that White does win, but White needs to change tack. There's not enough time to bring the king in uh, in this variation. The winning idea, and actually g4 is good too, but the simplest idea, I think, is knight g5. This sacrifices the rook on d7 to pile up on f7 with rook f4. Very, very strong. Now knight takes f7 is coming, and there's nothing to be done about it. Queen takes a4 is as good as anything else. Knight takes f7. This threatens two checkmates. There's mate here. And there's mate here. Both are checkmate and one. As a result, black needs to capture that knight. Uh, rook takes f7, uh, queen takes f7, check, king over, and simply queen takes g6. And even though white is down a piece, the ideas of rook f7 and queen takes h5 are obviously enough to finish off this king that has no more defenders. So that was how white could win, even if black anticipated the invasion of the king and immediately tried to push white back with bishop c8. However, black doesn't anticipate that and decides it's okay to just continue shuffling the rook between e8 and c8, so rook c8 is played, king g3, and still I think Timon doesn't realize what's happening. Rook over to e8, and now after king f4, I'm certain that Timon realized what was coming, but it is too late at this point. The king invasion is inevitable. Now bishop c8 trying to challenge the rook, but you just leave the rook hanging and king g5. And at this point, Timon resigned this stunning, stunning game. We should demonstrate this uh, on the board. First off, of course, if bishop takes d7, then the king simply takes that final step and it is mate next move with queen g7. Nothing black could have done would have delayed that even a little bit. What an incredible and beautiful final checkmating position. There are a couple of other checkmates kind of like this in chess, but it is certainly a tremendously special thing. The other idea that black has is after king g5 to try to keep the white king out with uh, king h7, stopping the king from invading to h6, but this allows queen takes g6 because the f7 pawn is pinned, and you can force basically the same mate, queen h6, and then king to f6. The queen and king have swapped positions here, but the basic mate is the same. The queen will go to g7. I hope that you have enjoyed this game. It is a tremendously special and instructive game. One of my favorite games to show beginning players. Both the finish, which is so famous, and the developing play before that are if incredibly you more of my ideas, favorite games of the 1990s, then simply click on the playlist that is sitting right on top of the board.